Hi. I am just in the process here of signing one of my books. And who's this going to? Michael Danamark. And I don't even say, huh. Well, somewhere overseas. <laughs> All right. So if you ever wondered, I just, I, I get the invoice and I say, thanks, Michael. A big exclamation point. Sound the name. And that's what you wind up with. And that's the book 99% True, which is my memoirs. It's funny. If you've never had a chance to read it, it's, I, anyway, it's, it's not all that serious. It's kind of a fun read. Um, I wanted to talk today about Michael Fremer. Now, Michael Fremer is my buddy. We've known each other for years. He's a reviewer at Stereophile and does the Analog Planet. He's a stand-up comedian, great guy. And a while ago, I did a Ask Paul about the distortion in vinyl. And Michael saw that and he said, I need a chance to respond. <laughs> of course, Michael, you are welcome on this channel. So here, my friends, is Michael Fremer's response to my video. Michael, take it away. So I want to thank Paul McGowan for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about vinyl and distortion. So my name was used in a question that Paul was asked the other day about the fact that I prefer listening to digitized vinyl on my Astle and Current player than to the downloaded or streamed files that you can get elsewhere. And that is true. So the question was, does vinyl add distortion to the picture when you, when you digitize it or when you play back a record compared to, let's say, the original tape or whatever? When you open a microphone to record something, you're adding distortion to the picture. Everything we do in making uh, recordings is a distortion adder. We don't make perfect recordings. Microphones are not perfect. Mixing boards are not perfect. None of it's perfect. The idea that you could take a symphony orchestra and put it into a couple of microphones and play it back and it sounds like the symphony orchestra, well, that doesn't happen. We all know that uh, live music, when you hear live music, you know, oh, it's live music, it's not a recording. So the bottom line is every recording is adding distortion and every technology that creates a recording, I don't care if it's cutting a lacquer or recording it to a DSD or two times DSD or four times DSD or a hundred times DSD or 192 24 bit or 96 24 all of these technologies produce certain kinds of distortions whether we can measure them or not and as far as I'm concerned when you digitize an analog signal whether it's a record or a tape you are adding a layer of audible distortion that you can easily hear. And I've been tested on this so many times. You won't hear the difference between this and that, or I'm gonna send you a bunch of files, and some are 9624 and some are 16-bit 44K, but you can't tell which is which because I've messed with the metadata. metadata. So play them, and I say, okay, that's 16-bit, that's 24-bit. How did you hear? I said, because you can hear it. And maybe you can hear it, but I can hear it, and a lot of people can hear it, and you can hear it too, actually. Over time, you'd recognize it. And if you don't recognize it right away, over time you would. At any rate, the point I'm trying to make is that whatever it is you like, whatever sounds more real or natural to your ear, is what you should like. And no one should tell you what to like, whether it's me telling you that records sound better or someone else telling you that digital is perfect. Digital is not perfect. Digital has fingerprints. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. Oh, by the way, Paul had said on this... Um, video the other day that they used to make direct-to-disc records so they still do make direct direct-to-disc records and I've got a couple over here that I would want to grab for wait, wait one second I'll be right back okay. and I'm flaunting this turntable here this is the Air Force Zero it's a half million dollar turntable I'm reviewing I'm not buying it it's really good by the way if you heard it you would go wow okay so let me just uh, I can't well I can't get in I can't, get, I can't get back there easily. I can get back there one night easily. So, uh, two years ago, the Berlin Philharmonic, a you know, pretty good outfit, 
they recorded uh, Bruckner's Seventh Symphony direct to disc, couple of microphones into a uh, tube mixing board, and right to a cutting lathe. That recording on a record sounds better than any digital recording I have ever heard, and it's not even close. And the same with uh, the Brahms Symphony set that the Berlin Philharmonic did. And the same with the Bamberg Symphony's recently released Mavles. Uh, so they still make some of those. But another point I wanted to make is that when digital recording started, what's the first thing that happened? For one of the first things that happened is the value of tube microphones, like Neumann tube microphones, which had dropped precipitously at some point along the line, the value of those microphones went through the roof. Why is that? Because the digital recordings were not perfect, but on top of that, the sound was so sterile and, and bleak that recording engineers, whether they liked the digital process or not, and a lot of them did, realized that if they introduced the distortion produced by the tube microphone, it would warm it up and make it sound more like real music. So this whole thing, this whole process of recording is, it's a recipe. It's your mixing ingredients to get a final result. And so those microphones are now extremely collectible and valuable because they use them. Because the tubes, which have higher distortion ratings than the solid state microphones, you can be sure, add something that makes the music sound more real. So this is, um, this is an acetate of Art Blakey and Night in Tunisia uh, from the Blue Note record, which is one of the first Blue Notes I ever bought back in the 60s when I was, when I was uh, not so young, actually. But anyway, uh, so this is what an acetate looks like. It's the same as a quote-unquote lacquer. And it's, uh, it's starting to get some mold and fungus growing on it. Uh, which I will take care of using the Kermis method, which really works, by the way. But when I got this uh, 45 RPM acetate, I played it once, and the sound is, it's insane how good this is. Certainly better than anything you can stream of this recording, or any digital version, certainly better than any CD version of this. So I digitized it right away at 9624 using a very good uh, A to D converter that I have here. And I would go to shows and play this file for people. And you know, people went crazy because it sounds insane. Recorded using a really great turntable that costs almost as much as my house. But that's a whole nother story. So I would play this file. For years I did this. And I've got another acetate like this of uh, one side of Tommy by The Who at 45 RPM done from the original master tape. And I digitized that too. And I play that around, and people go nuts because they've never heard a Tommy sound that good. So, two years ago, back when there were hi fi shows that you could actually go to, I said, This acetate is now probably almost 10 years old. These things tend to deteriorate anyway because, you know, what is it? It's basically a kind of paint on an aluminum disc, and over time, the paint starts to sort of droop and droop, and you lose quality. I said, So, if that's what's happening, why not bring it to a hi-fi show? Why not play it for people live on a turntable and let them hear what it sounds like? So I started doing that. And I hadn't played this thing in 10 years, but I had a fixed recollection of what the file sounded like. And the file sounded great, digitized at 9624. So the first show that I took it to, to play it, I put it on the turntable. And I think this was at the Tampa Audio Show two years ago. And I played it. and. People went crazy, of course, because it, it's insane. And I went crazy, too, because I realized how much the digitized version lost from the live playback. It wasn't even close. There were, there were details. There was a certain something I cannot measure yet that was clearly lost in f the musical flow or the sense of space or s something or other we can't measure. Whatever it was... The live playback of this acetate was just so much better. And it wasn't because it was another layer of distortion being added because I was playing it back. So um, Sometimes when I put these things back in jackets really quickly when I'm doing the video, people go crazy because they go, look how you're treating your records. Well, if I sit here for 10 minutes <laughs> putting it back in the jacket really carefully, you get very bored. Like I'm having trouble with it right now. So... Uh, 
I'm going to edit this <laughs> because it took me too long. Here's another thing I want to talk about is people say records wear out. Okay, this is my original pressing of Abbey Road, British pressing of Abbey Road, that I bought in 1969. I've been playing this record since 1969. I cannot tell you how many times. It sounds better than any digital version there is. Now, the recent uh, Giles Martin Abbey Road remix sounds really, really good. He fixed certain things in the mix that they couldn't do back in those days that makes it better. But honestly, aside from that, the sound of this, the sound of the cymbals, the sound of the instruments, the transients, everything else about this record, even though it's been played for 50, how many years? 1969 to now? It just sounds so much better played live. And I've done this demo. People come over here and they, you know, they want to hear CDs or, you know, digital files versus records. Nobody, nobody, and I have a very good deck, a very, very good deck. Nobody walks out of here saying, nah, the file sounded better, the digital sounds better. Not one person. You know, one time when I first moved into this house 21 years ago, when CDs were ruling the, the roost, uh, my neighbor invited me over to, uh, to a pool party. And we got in the pool, and we're sitting there around, actually we were in the hot tub, sitting around the hot tub. And this guy that owned the house said to the people, you see this guy over here? He plays records. He thinks records sound better than CDs. And they're all looking at me like, this is like 1999, by the way. This guy's crazy. What are you kidding? I said, okay, dry off, put your clothes on, come on over, let's do a little listening. And they said, okay. Now at that point in time, I had a four stack DCS Scarlatti, one of the DCS stacks, top of the line. And the Rolling Stones catalog had just come out in super audio CD mastered from the original tapes. I think uh, Bob Ludwig did the mastering. He knows what he's doing. I had those SACDs on it. What at the time was a state-of-the-art digital playback system. So they came over, and most of these guys, now all of these guys, none of them had ever heard a really good stereo. So you know, they're looking, what is this? Oh my God, okay. So now, now I'm gonna play you the Rolling Stones. I'm gonna play you Aftermath, which I pulled out this British copy of Aftermath, which I have had since it was new, 1967. So I took it out. First, I played for them the SACD of Aftermath. And they were like, oh my God, I've never heard anything like that. It's like, it's like, I never heard that. That's amazing. I said, that's a super audio CD. That is better than a CD. And they all said, yeah, well, no, no kidding. It's unbelievable. We've never heard a system like this. And that was it. I said, now I'm going to play you this record that I've been playing since 1969. And I took it out and I put it on. And it took like 10 seconds. And the guy that had the good seat said, oh my God, that was good. But Mick Jagger is right there. I mean, I can see him in three dimensional space. He's right there. It's no contest. Th that is much better. I don't understand that. I said, because you've been fed a load of crap for 20 years about what sounds better. Anyway, more recently, um, this is Paul McCartney's first solo record. I'm sure a lot of you know this record. It's a really nice record. He did it in his home studio, and it's got some great songs on it. Junk, uh, and uh, that would be something really good. This record sounds amazing. So, more recently, Miles Shewell, who I know, was a, was a nice guy, he did the half-speed mastered version from that same tape. Tape still exists, and it's in good shape. But he does half-speed mastering, and he has to use a digital source, because that's the way his lathe is set up. So, he transferred it at 9624 and cut from the 9624 file, and it sounds really good. It does sound good. But it doesn't sound nearly as good as this. It's not even close. When Paul McCartney, and that would be something, gets that first set of symbols, it's like right there on the record, on, on the original record, on the digitized version, it's like good. I'm telling you. So, so the point I'm trying to make is that every rec recording format, everything we listen to that's a record, whether it's on a CD or an SACD or quadraphonic DSD, four times DSD or 12 times DSD, they all have sonic signatures, all of them. And which sounds better to you is the one you should go with. But I'm telling you, a good clean record played back on a good system sounds the best.
It's not close. I wanted to say. So Paul and I go back decades. It's the '80s. I bought my first PS Audio phono, my first preamp. It was a PS Audio 4.0, and it was great at two things. It was great at being up to my knowledge at that point, extremely transparent to whatever was fed it. And it did a really good job of picking up the Hackensack Hospital that I lived right behind when they would bring somebody in. I knew all the people that were in accidents. I knew everybody was coming in on a stretcher. I knew if there was a fire because that thing picked up everything. And that's because at that point in time, they were designing in the woods in Oregon or in, in Seattle or something. And there was no uh, RFI or there was none of this stuff happening, so they didn't know that it was that. Anyway, I'm sure Paul will have a laugh at that now. He, he can cut this out if he wants to. And uh, the other thing I have to thank PS for is I added a outdoor auxiliary generator to give me electricity when there was uh, a power failure. It's got a giant transfer switch on the side of the house, and I did not think, and I did not realize that that transfer switch uh, completely destroyed the sound of my stereo. It was, it ruined it. I mean, it, it was so shocking. They came in, they turned the power off, they put in the generator, they put in the transfer switch, that, it's this giant switch that takes the electricity from the street to the generator. And even when the generator wasn't working, the sound of my stereo, it was, I mean, they flipped the switch and put the power back on after six hours of it being out. And it was like, what happened? Now I have two big boom boxes, one on the left channel, one on the right channel, and all the transient response was gone. All, all of the, the detail, all the three-dimensionality, all the blackness in the background, gone. So I figured, well, maybe I could try a PS Audio Regenerator, because that's going to regenerate all new electricity and essentially take me off the grid. So. PS was nice enough to send me a P20 and a P15, and as soon as I put those in, my stereo was back. Those things work. So two things I want to say about that. If you live in an apartment building and you don't know how your electricity is getting into your apartment, you should try one of these. You'd be amazed at what a difference it might make for you. And the other thing is, like, if I didn't bother to... Well, I'm going to try doing a, a bypass around this transfer switch and see what that does. If that doesn't solve the problem, I'll have to just buy these two, two units. But... Um, I'm going to find out. But if, like, if I didn't do this, if somebody moved into my house after I left, and was, who was an audiophile, a, and set up their system, they would never know. They would never know how bad their stereo was sounding. It would sound fine to them, because they wouldn't know that they were hearing what I heard before I got the P15 and the P20. So, you know, my advice to you is... I see this stupid stuff on the internet, like, if your amplifier is properly made, then you don't need any kind of power conditioning because blah, blah, blah. You know, have these people ever bothered to listen and hear? No, they just know. There's so much bad information on the internet, including this, according to some people. I'm sure they're going to say this was all crap, but that's okay. Anyway, thanks for listening, and thank you, Paul, for letting me have my say, because I want to tell you that Digitized vinyl sounds better than the commercially available files, and live, all analog vinyl records, nothing beats them. As soon as you digitize them, you kind of ruin them. That's my opinion. Okay, thanks. Have fun.